Does the microphone help? Can you guys hear me at the back? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to Module 4. Uh, module 4 was meant to be a natural progression of the first three modules. So yesterday, uh, through Mike and Aaron's uh, presentations and lab work, you got the chance to take reads, align them to a reference genome, call single nucleotide polymorphisms, call structural variants, uh, and now we're going to become experts in how to use visualization tools to help uh, look at these and, in particular, see if they're actually true variants and sort of assess the quality of them. So, the learning objectives of this module are sort of to appreciate uh, the spectrum of visualization tools in genomics. We're going to be focusing on the set of genome browsers, but I want you guys to see the big, bigger picture in the context of, of all the other uh, genome visualization tools that you could possibly use to throw at your problem. Uh, you guys are going to become gurus at looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms and structural variants. I know you guys uh, sort of ended short yesterday with structural variants, but I promise you, you guys will uh, almost be sick of looking at structural <laughs> variants by the end of uh, the labs. Um, and then if there's time, I'm going to talk about uh, looking forward beyond genome browsers and where we see uh, the future of visualization tools going, uh, hopefully if we have time. Okay, so part one. Before the break, we're going to do a short lecture on genome browsers, then the lab's going to show you uh, visualization of SNPs and structural variants, and then the second part, if we have time again, is talking about search engines. If we run out of time, we'll just uh, move part one into part two. Okay. I want to start by uh, further motivating the, the need to visualize your data. Often it's seen as sort of this process that you do at the end, but I really want to sort of coach you and sort of... Uh, convince you that visualization is a process that um, is really beneficial to your analysis and it's something that computers can't really do very well. So the first uh, example which is shown in all sort of data visualization conferences you ever go to um, is this example called Anscombe's Quartet. So what you see here on the left are four sets of data. Uh, they're uh, XY pairs and they all have the exact same mean and variance. What you see on the right is a visualization of those four data sets. And so what becomes very clear just by quickly looking at it is that the data sets are completely different. They have different set of trends. Um, and just by looking at a picture of them, you could easily tell um, that they're different despite having sort of the simple uh, statistics being identical. So understanding trends is, is one thing that visualization is really good at doing uh, with a minimal amount of work. Uh, the second thing is the ability to identify outliers, uh, and this is really important in the context of uh, debugging your software. So your visualization system pre-attentively processes this image, and what that means is you do, unconsciously, you can detect that red dot. Uh, you actually do minimal amount of effort, and I want to prove to you that this happens entirely unconsciously. So this is, there's going to be an image that flashes on the screen. Uh, it's going to be very quick, but you will be able to identify the outlier in the image. Did everyone catch it? What was it? Red dot. So you actually have a set of different uh, pre-attentive features that we can take advantage of, which includes uh, color, size, shape. Uh, so if we use these, these different parameters in our visualizations, you will be able to detect things like structural variants and single nucleotide polymorphisms really quickly. So the point is, is that you are a relatively low cost and high performance sense maker to identify patterns in your data set and debugger to identify issues with your data set. Um, and this is compared to the cost of writing a script that would go through and otherwise identify those patterns. OK, so let's jump into visualization tools. So there are a whole suite of different visualization tools that you could use to look at your data. And the question I often get is, which one, which one do I use? There are just alone over 40 different genome browsers. So it really depends on the task at hand, the kind and size of your data, and data privacy. 
Um, so we'll get to genome browsers in a second, but I consider the genome browser like the sledgehammer of visualization tools. But there are certain problems that you want to solve with a wrench, for example. So other tools which we won't discuss in detail today, uh, these are just two such tools uh, that came out of Martin Kaczynski's lab. You've actually seen these yesterday. This is a circles plot which helps you to identify uh, structural variants which range over uh, a distance. So here we have the chromosomes uh, outlined uh, along a circular sort of path, and we have connections going between them. The hive plot is uh, a tool built by the same guy, um, and it's good for identifying trends in clusters of, of groups of entities. So if you've seen sort of the hairballs, if you're looking at a protein-protein interaction network, this is a way of sort of clustering and connecting uh, various entities. So if you're doing that kind of analysis, that's what I said, it depends on the task at hand. If you're doing that kind of analysis, this is something that is much better suited for a circles plot than a genome browser, for example. So, but in the context of this workshop, we're again going to be focusing on genome browsers. Uh, and just to make the disclaimer, I'm uh, the developer for the tool on the right, just so that's clear. <laughs> but uh, I would recommend these two these two tools if you're going to be looking at high-throughput sequencing data. So the reason that is, is that these were made in the era where high-throughput sequencing data was just becoming popular, and so they were built uh, upon that structure. So they're especially good for looking at previously identified variants, like the ones that you guys did yesterday. Uh, it has the ability to handle large NAM files, as you've already seen, which are stored locally or on a web server. Uh, and one advantage is that you have implicit data privacy. So because these actually run on your computer and not in the cloud, you can keep all your data local. And depending on your data privacy restrictions, that could make or break your decision. Uh, but I don't want you to uh, be sort of narrow-minded. You could also try UCSC Genome Browser and this new genome browser called Trackster. So UCSC Genome Browser is probably the most traditional and widely used genome browser, and it's been retrofitted recently to be able to handle your own BAM files. So you could actually look at this uh, in, in UCSC. Trackster, I, I hope it's part of the Galaxy Lab today. It's really cool. It um, integrates with Galaxy in the sense that you can fine-tune parameters for programs that you're running on the cloud. And once you're satisfied with the local window, so you, you just run the analysis on your local window and it shows you the results. Once you're satisfied with those results, you can then dispatch it onto the cloud and it will run on your whole data set. So it's a nice way to do visualization and analysis to sort of spot check before you actually commit to running a long process. So the genome browser that you guys are going to be working with today uh, is Savant. It's the tool that I've been developing. Um, it's particularly designed to use high throughput sequencing data and to emphasize single nucleotide and structural variants. And so what we tried to do is make identifying those events pre-attentive. So on the left, you see an uh, image of a SNP. So I'll explain what these are in, in an actual demo. But this is a coverage distribution split by strands. So these are reads coming from the positive strand and the negative strand. And this is just a plot of coverage. And what you see here on these plots are the proportion of reads which mismatch with respect to the reference. So a SNP is just evidenced by a single line. We came up with this new visualization technique for mate pairs. So you guys learned of a paired end mapping approach to identifying structural variants. Uh, and what you see here is an event that's a homozygous or heterozygous deletion. And I'm going to explain uh, how we encoded the mate pairs in, in a second. OK. So it's time for some more DNA gymnastics, in the words of Eric. So Aaron covered, sorry, <clears throat> Aaron covered the processes of uh, finding structural variants. Um, two of them are depth of coverage and paired end mapping. And depth of coverage is, is a pretty simple technique. If, if there are two copies in the genome that you're sequencing and only one in the reference, you're just going to get an overabundance of the reads. And you'll see um, sort of an overabundance of that pileup when you're looking at that region of the genome. Conversely, if there's been a deletion, so if that individual only had one copy versus two, you're going to see a relative decrease in the coverage. Another approach is this paired end mapping technique, and this is the ones that I'm going to go through. So in the case of a small insertion, where your library is such that mate pairs actually span that insertion, 
what you'll get when you perform your mappings is a cluster of discordant mate pairs that have insert sizes or mapped insert sizes which are less than what you'd expect. So insertions get smaller. So remember that. Large insertions. So in the case where you have a large insertion such that the mate pair doesn't span the entire length, you're not going to get anything which um, crosses that breakpoint. And so here we have basically everything, all the mate pairs coming from the left of that breakpoint, map to the left, and everything to the right, map to the right, but you get nothing crossing. And so you'll just see a dip right at the particular breakpoint of the effect. Any questions so far? OK. Uh, I, I suggest that you use these slides as a reference. When you're looking at the, the, these instances in, in a genome browser, use this as a reference. Um, and if, if it helps, draw it out on paper, like Aaron was saying. It really makes sense once you draw all these out and try to map everything. So in the case of a deletion, when you have um, this mate pair in the middle is spanning the breakpoint, uh, we will map either end to the sides of the deletion and you're going to get a cluster of discordant mate pairs such that they're too large. Their map distance is too large. So the only trick is insertions uh, that span the breakpoint, the mate pairs are mapped closer together, and deletions, they're mapped farther apart. OK, so inversions, inversions and tandem duplications, I won't go through there. So I'm sorry, Peter. Hello? I don't know. Maybe. OK. Uh, so inversions and, and tandem duplications uh, are very similar. What you get in these case, what you get in these cases are cases where one of the read actually maps in a different orientation with respect to the order in which they were sequenced. And same here with tandem duplication. So what happens here is first read actually maps here, and the second one actually maps behind it. And so you get a, a relative uh, discordancy with respect to the order. Just some feedback. Do you have your cell phone in there? Is that what's causing it? Is yeah, it the same in the same pockets? Yeah. You should take it out because I think that's what's causing it. Maybe I'm getting a call. Sorry about and, that. Uh, it's on. Try it again. Test. Yeah, test. Go. Say a couple words. Test one, two, three. Yeah. Four. <laughs> you guys are efficient. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so like I mentioned, Savant, oh, that's a lot better. Uh, Savant has this, this way of uh, uh, depicting structural variants or mate pairs in such a way that it makes um, structural variants pre-attentive. So you shouldn't have to do much conscious work to be able to say, aha, that's a structural variant. Uh, so your job is then to interpret what kind of event it was based on um, the order and size of the, the <coughs> mate pairs that are being mapped. So what we do is we connect the two endpoints. So the first mapping and the second mapping by an arc. And the height of that arc corresponds to how far those reads were mapped apart. If it's the case where reads map in different orientation than we expect, we also color them differently. So they're going to pop out in terms of color as well. I already showed you that video. OK, so some examples. Here we're going to take a look at single nucleotide polymorphisms. You've seen this. Uh, this is much the same as you've seen in IGV. So here we have reads piled up to the location that they've mapped to. They're colored light blue if they map to the forward strand, and dark blue if they've mapped to the negative strand. What you see scattered across these are mismatches with respect to the reference genome. And in the case where we have a SNP, there's just a column of consistently mismatched bases with respect to the reference. So that's pretty straightforward, and you've already seen this before. 
we have a, two special modes called SNP mode. This just abstracts away all the information and clutter that's caused by drawing individual reads. And here we just show that coverage plot. Um, and where you see these mismatches, these are just uh, stacked up here. So here, again, you see that column just a little bit clearer. And in strand SNP mode, we just compartmentalize um, that coverage plot into positive and negative strand. And this is useful for identifying uh, strand bias. Uh, Mike brought this up yesterday. Um, typically, what we've seen is um, there's an erroneous mismatch that's introduced in one of the reads, and that gets amplified through PCR. And so what you see is on one strand only, you'll get one mismatch that sort of propagates throughout your data. And so here you would be able to easily disentangle that approach where here we're getting support from reads coming from both strands. So that's, that's a good sign. Okay, so uh, IGV has a, a, a way of displaying mate pairs. Um, here we have a line which connects two reads that are paired. And so remember deletions get bigger, insertions tend to get smaller. So here this is evidence for a homozygous deletion where we have uh, a set or a cluster of discordant mate pairs such that their mapped distance is further apart than than what's expected from the library. And this works really well for homozygous deletions. In just a few seconds, we'll show the heterozygous case. So what we found is in the heterozygous case, you actually get uh, a set of discordant mate pairs which are too far apart, but you also get the normal ones, which kind of clutter your view. So here we're, we actually have See, some of these are overextended, but the ones at the top are normal, and so there's not a clear distinction um, between those two sets of mate pairs, or kinds of mate pairs. So now we're going to look at the corresponding arc visualization of those two events. So this is the homozygous event that we were just looking at. So here we have a pretty clear set of discordant mate pairs. Again, there's no information coming from the center, so this is uh, support for it being homozygous. Um, and we can identify the breakpoints here. Any questions about So these are, this is parameterized, so you have to specify to the browser what you see as discordant. Again, it has to be based on knowledge of your library. So you would know that your library has, has a slot size of 500 base pairs. And then you would say to, to Savant, anything larger than 800, for example, I want to flag that as being red. So here's a heterozygous case. And uh, it's unfortunate that this is actually uh, a very large event. Um, but imagine that this set of mate pairs actually goes off into the distance and comes down at some point. Uh, because it's so large, we don't actually draw the whole arc. Um, but the concept is the same. So here, this is a heterozygous deletion that starts here. And I'm hopeful it might not be as obvious on the projection. But does it look like this region is more dense than to the right side of that breakpoint. Okay, so there should be a relative thinning out, approximately half, um, because of that heterozygous event. So we're going to jump to the mate pair, and it should switch. So inside of this event, we have a relative thinning out of our coverage. So this is the right side of the breakpoint. So here, here we were thin, and there we're a little bit more dense. And you can validate this also by looking at depth of coverage. So depth of coverage and paired end mapping sort of are complementary in this sense. If you looked at the coverage, uh, there would be about half as much in that region. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, it's the number of pairs. <coughs> so here, here each line represents a uh, connection between pairs. Okay. Yeah. This is just sort of just for fun to, I uh, just to know how uh, the resolution, how, how good it is. So say you had two alleles uh, with respect to the actual reference genome. So you have an individual that's heterozygous for basically a similar location of a deletion, but not the exact same one. So would you see essentially like where they're perfectly matching the reference genome, you would have like that, that nice dark area, mm -hmm. kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Or could you have then, sort of where that red arc starts, could you then have a section where you have that in, an intermediate density, and then a really faint density, and then intermediate, and then back to, could you actually pick that up with something like yeah. that? Yeah, you could. And I, I'm not sure if they're in this data set. I, I only looked through a portion of them. There's, you're actually going to get to look at all the structural variants that were called as part of uh, Aaron's lab. Okay. And there are some hairy events. And, and so it's important to, to recognize that these events tend to happen together. They're not sort of discrete events that could happen in combination. We talked about the shattering. So it, it, they get pretty hairy sometimes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. So I think that's... That's about it. So it's lab time. Um, there's the first link is using Savant to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms and structural variants. So that's this one. Yeah, so we, we found that every time we tried to validate calls, it would typically be because strand bias was just coming out. So we implemented that as sort of a greedy feature for ourselves. You can see a new cluster of Yeah, so it, it's all on the wiki. The first thing you guys are going to do is um, load a BAM file. Uh, there are URLs all posted there. Um, and then the first step is to load, let's see here. You're going to load the set of read alignments for all of chromosome 1 for um, that, that individual that we've been looking at uh, in the previous modules. Then you're going to look at um, the structural variants that we called yesterday as part of Aaron's lab. So what we're going to do is import those as a set of bookmarks, and we can use that as a basis for navigating to all those positions. And then uh, my hope is that you guys will switch to this arc mode and be able to uh, quickly identify the signatures. So I've annotated each, uh, each of the structural variant calls with what the call was, so whether it's an inversion or deletion. Uh, and so you can sort of cross-reference that from what, with what you see and sort of just make sense of it. Uh, and then last, we're going to take a look at um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So there was a question about what happens with uh, translocations. And we can use uh, the arc mode to visualize translocations. What we do is we draw a, an arc, but it just doesn't go anywhere. It just has an arrow. And then if you mouse over that arrow, it'll tell you the location on the other chromosome that, you can, that it goes to. And you can just mouse over and, and click to jump to that location as well. 